last week we finished with the discussion of different types of infection and also we briefly talked about basic reproduction number and we are moving forward towards the discussion of different uh, what influences the process the outcomes of the infection and we're going to talk about the whole infectious process from the standpoint of microorganism what steps does the infection go through so um, any infectious disease any pathogen can be characterized by its pathogenicity and virulence those are not essentially synonyms pathogenicity is a qualitative term which basically tells you whether the microorganism can or cannot cause the disease um, in sort of a normal settings I understand you know define normal but uh, when we talk let's say about two different straight uh, uh, two different species of staphylococci and we say you know stuff epidermidis staphylococcus epidermidis is non-pathogenic because normally you know it's the component of human skin microbiome which um, doesn't cause the disease and stuff aureus can cause the disease and we call it pathogenic <laughs> microorganisms. does that make sense okay now virulence is more of a, a quantitative characteristic which tells you how severe the disease will be okay let's say we have um, you know there are two different strains of influenza right you have Spanish flu and you have regular H3 and 2 seasonal one. and Spanish flu can be more devastating than seasonal because of certain um, arrangements of virulence factors does that make sense or say um, there is a vesicular stomatitis virus which can cause mild disease in humans and there is a virus from the same family which is a rabies virus which kills people okay so these two viruses have different virulence they both pathogenic they both cause the disease but the extent of the disease is different does that make sense to you the difference between pathogenicity and virulence now <clears throat> both can be explained from the standpoint of virulence factors of a pathogen and the immunity and you know overall state of the host so what are the virulence factors anything that is responsible for signs and or symptoms of infection say um, microorganism called clostridium perfringens produces a virulence factor called alpha toxin that causes necrosis of the human tissue okay there you go alpha toxin is the virulence factor you knock out alpha toxin there's no virulence factor that modified quote-unquote modified <clears throat> strain of clostridium difficile will be much less virulent does that make sense you understand what I'm saying or um, there are no known situation when there is a mutation in a viral genome that allows a virus to evade immune response so it makes it more virulent because it is more likely to cause the disease we good another important thing is of course the portal of entry um, say take HIV virus is just so easy take HIV it is transmitted either sexually or by a blood right so basically it means that you can hypothetically drink a bunch of HIV containing viral suspension and nothing's gonna happen as long as it is not exposed to the blood does that make sense to you same goes for say rabies rabies is entirely via blood transmitted via blood so you can drink basically rabies and nothing's gonna happen to you because it cannot survive in the stomach or intestine that makes sense so portal of entry is important now we're going to talk about it a little bit more um, how actually different portals of entry for the same pathogen can lead to different diseases different manifestations of the disease and there is 
an infectious dose. Okay, uh, you may have heard on some other occasions the phrase "the dose makes the poison." Okay, so it's it's pretty applicable to the pathogens as well, because uh, if you if the infectious dose, the dose that is necessary to actually start the infectious process, is say a million cells, and you get inoculated by ten cells, you're not going to get sick. <laughs> and actually, you see it all the time. You know, you walk around, you, you touch things, okay, and there's a bunch of microorganisms on your hands, and you touch your face, you touch food, you eat that food. But you don't get digestive diseases all the time because amount of my you probably consume some pathogenic microorganisms, just not in the significant amounts. Okay, we got it. Now, what about the host from the host side? Um, genetic susceptibility influences the the, the virulence. Um, right now, plague is not as virulent as it was. 700 years ago. <clears throat> Why? Because all those epidemics, pandemics of plague over time killed people who were most genetically sensitive to it. So kind of weeded them out. Okay. Uh, immunosuppression makes a, a big difference in terms of the virulence, the infection that can be fairly mild. It's a common cold. It uh, can lead to devastating pneumonia in people who are immunosuppressed. Pregnancy affects the uh, course of infection. It's quite interesting because during pregnancy, women are immunosuppressed, slightly immunosuppressed. So uh, some infections may um, come out as being more severe in pregnant women. Various systemic diseases. Uh, by systemic diseases, I mean conditions like cancer, diabetes, various metabolic disorders that somehow affect the inflammatory processes. Um, age, it's actually quite interesting. Generally, we consider, you know, um, really, really small children and elderly being most susceptible. It is true, in general, yes, but <clears throat> for some diseases, for instance, uh, for encephalitis, uh, from the clinical standpoint, brain inflammation runs easier in children than in adults because of the soft cranium. Um, sometimes elderly have certain set of antibodies they were exposed to that condition before so they are now protected okay um, other infections if you're already sick getting another infection you know much easier makes you sicker is that clear um, any kind of um, traumatic experience because uh, physical trauma or surgery is a stress Stress means cortisol. Cortisol means suppressed inflammation and suppressed immune response. And finally, previous exposure to a pathogen. Uh, one of the greatest examples when, you know, disease like measles that was, you know, fairly bad in, um, say, 17th, 18th century in Europe uh, had absolutely devastating effect on the Native American population because they had absolutely zero previous exposure to measles. Measles was not known um, in the North Americas before Europeans arrived. Now, you, you can imagine that in European population, measles was pretty common, so a lot of kids had, you know, other maternal immunity, you know, transferred through the breast milk or transplacentally, or they were exposed and never got sick, stuff like that. Make sense? Now, let's talk about doses first of all we're going to talk about you know portal of entry we're going to talk about the dose and we're going to talk about different virulence factors so dose median infectious dose it's called id50 it's the dose necessary to cause infection in 50 percent of an experimental group and median lethal dose is ld50 okay so ld50 is the dose minimal dose that is necessary to kill 50% of the population. Makes sense, right? Um, now, y you have to understand that it's really hard to determine the lethal dose for people, okay? They mostly determine using animal models. 
you can, um, for milder infections, <clears throat> you can actually determine the median infectious dose for various pathogens. You can actually get approval for such experiments. Okay, but for <clears throat> say you can probably do it for common cold, but it will be much harder to do it for say HIV. Now, if you would look at the now, this graph shows you, you know, the dynamic of number of you know, percent of people that are dying from the number of <coughs> particles of a pathogen, whether it's a cell or virus particle, <coughs> it doesn't matter. <coughs> so you see, it's not linear. Now, how does um, infectious or lethal dose? How does it correlate? with the uh, virulence. Well, generally speaking, you can imagine <clears throat> that the lower infectious dose correlates with a higher virulence. Does that make sense? Because it means that you need less particles to cause the disease. Now, you have to be careful in this assumption because you cannot really compare two different pathogens. You know what I'm talking about? So say, Let's take this three viruses. Hepatitis A, norovirus, or rotavirus. So norovirus has the lower infectious dose, median infectious dose, than rotavirus. But in terms of the symptoms, norovirus is about 24 to 48 hour long gastroenteritis. Rotavirus is a life-threatening condition in children and even in adults can run on for couple of weeks. So rotavirus is more virulent if you look at the entire picture of signs and symptoms, but has slightly higher infectious dose. So we, we cannot compare two different pathogens. Does that make sense? Or <clears throat> another good example is um, causative agent of cholera, vibrio cholerae, versus, um, say, I don't know, Shigella. So Shigella, Shigellosis is a dysentery. It's a pretty severe disease that can be lethal, but um, fairly treatable. Now, if you would compare Shigellosis to, say, a clinical picture of cholera, which is profuse and abundant watery diarrhea, and people basically die of dehydration, um, cholera is probably, in terms of the clinical management, is much harder than Shigellosis. You see what I'm saying? So, but cholera has much higher um, median infectious dose. What you can do, you can compare pathogens that belong to, say, <clears throat> same species, but different strains. So this is a great example. Three different strains of E. coli from Entroinvasive to entrotoxigenic. Okay, actually four strains because I forgot to include the entrohemorrhagic one. So entrohemorrhagic E. coli has the lowest infectious dose, right? You see that? Well, out of these four, um, entrohemorrhagic E. coli causes the most severe infection. Okay, it's as bad as shigellosis, let's say. So you can use median infectious or median lethal dose to compare virulence of the pathogens that are closely related, but you cannot really do anything or compare pathogens that are distantly related based on this data. Does that make sense? So know the definitions. Please do not memorize the table. I will not ask you about any numbers from here. Now, portals. Um, Conceptually, it's a pretty simple idea. You know, you have certain portals of entry and certain, certain portals of exit. Say, mucosal membranes can be a portal of entry. And generally speaking, like respiratory tract, digestive tract, skin, um, blood can be a portal of entry. Does that make sense? And then portal of exit is a body site through which pathogen is shedded. So it can be respiratory tract for respiratory transmitted pathogens such as flu, 
it can be digestive tract and it can be both you know vomitous uh, such as nor for norovirus or feces um, you can shed it with the bodily fluids from urine to sweat like the ball of ours um, blood can be a source of transmission does that make sense to you now in some cases if microorganism enters through say unconventional portal of entry it may lead to unconventional set of symptoms and when I say unconventional you have to understand that say okay let's put it this way you have a bunch of digestive microorganisms right the ones that can cause gastroenteritis say the ones that we worked with last week um, Proteus mirabilis can cause gastroenteritis E. coli, serratia mercessin, salmonella typhi, they all can cause gastroenteritis, okay? If those, <clears throat> sorry, microorganisms end up in the urinary tract, they cause urinary tract infections. It's not conventional place for them to be. Does that make sense? So they cause sort of an unconventional presentation. If those microorganisms enter the blood, it will lead to a condition known as gram-negative bacteremia. You see what I'm trying to say? So unconventional port of entry may lead to unconventional presentation of symptoms. <coughs> so you don't need really to um, know to memorize the list of microorganisms that, you know, where are they? Like, I'm not going to ask you a question specifically um, on the microorganisms that were never covered before. Uh, I don't know, say rickettsia, you know, what's the portal of entry for rickettsia? We didn't talk about rickettsia. So nothing from that table will be on the exam, except for one term that I will mention in a second. What I wanted to talk to you here is sort of usual versus unusual portal. So look at this, chlamydia. We all know chlamydia is the sexually transmitted disease. If it gets in the eyes, it causes trachoma, chlamydial conjunctivitis. Herpes simplex, conventionally, conventionally, the route of entry is mouth, okay, for HSV1. If it somehow gets into the blood and then to the brain, leads to the encephalitis. For hemophilus influenza, for some reason I just missed the data, but normally it's found in ear and causes otitis media. It gets into the brain, can cause meningitis, okay? Neisseria, same way as chlamydia. Neisseria, gonorrhea causes sexually transmitted disease that we all know gonorrhea. Gets in the eye, leads to conjunctivitis, okay? E. coli, that's what I mentioned, you know, digestive tract. In digestive tract, E. coli causes diarrhea. In urethra, it causes urinary tract infection. Now, this one, this is the term you need to know. Torch. Just what it stands for. Because it will come up multiple occasions in your clinicals and in your practice. Um, I think it's kind of a funny term. Because it stands for uh, toxoplasma. And a bunch of infections that we just don't have a, a good acronym for other they include syphilis both hepatitis bnc hiv then you have rubella cmv hsv1 herpes simplex virus one torch are neonatal pathogens pathogens that can be uh, transmitted via placenta huh neonatal pathogens so yeah they are they affecting babies basically specifically if the mom has them the baby will have them too uh, one of the most notorious torch pathogens rubella okay in adults rubella causes well relatively severe disease but um, the chances are you're not gonna die from it if you otherwise healthy Okay, but if rubella runs in the pregnant woman, 
then the virus will be transmitted by a placenta to a fetus and will cause a variety of neonatal abnormalities. It's one of the leading causes of microcephaly in the world. Okay, we're talking about, uh, as far as I remember, about 50,000 cases of rubella happen every year in the world, which is too much for the disease that is completely vaccine preventable. Make sense? Now, what are the stages of infectious process? Well, first stage is adhesion. Okay. Good. So adhesion um, is when microorganisms attach the surface of the pathogen. We good? We're clear? Bacteria have a number of tools for this, and you need to know these five tools. Again, just reminding you, you don't need to list them, but you need to recognize them as tools for adhesion. Adhesion proteins or adhesins, fimbriae or pili, external appendages, capsule or slime layer okay does that make sense is that understood so basically what kind of question i can ask what is the function of bacterial fimbriae in the infection it facilitates adhesion to the to the surface does that make sense to you <clears throat> we're clear now viruses To adhere to the cell and remember they must do that they must adhere to the cell because they are obligate intracellular pathogens viruses interact with a specific receptor so while well, for bacteria the way they adhere to the cells may define which tissues bacteria infect for viruses presence or absence of the receptor will be a determinant for the tissue tropism. You understand the word tropism or statement and expression tissue tropism. Let me ask you a practical question. So what is the tissue tropism for the common cold virus? What is what is it in fact? Respiratory system, yeah, that's well that that would be organ tropism or system tropism. Like for tissue tropism, say for hepatitis, what would be tissue tropism? Liver. Okay? Hepatocytes of the liver. Does that make sense? Now, um, you know that some microorganisms can infect virtually anything. Take um, I don't know, streptococci. They can cause infections of the skin, infections of the uh, pharynx, and they can cause infections of the heart, and they can infect, say, uh, meninges, right? So they're going to be, this is sometimes referred to as, it's a good word to know, pleiotropic infections. Pleiotropic means, pleio means many. Tropic means, you know, the site of infection, so many sites. Is that clear? No. Well, viruses, I, I'm fascinated by viruses specifically because some of them have very, very narrow tissue tropism. Take hepatitis virus, hepatitis B or hepatitis C. It infects only liver cells. Okay. Take poliovirus. Now, polyvirus is interesting because it, in, in, in the humans, it infects either epithelial cells of the gut or if it jumps, you know, into the, through the enteric plexus, you know, nervous plexus into the neurons, it can infect neurons. Does that make sense? 
Now, interestingly enough, poliovirus cannot infect mice. For one simple reason, mice do not have the receptor for poliovirus. So they're completely refractory to it. Does that make sense? Now, if you will make transgenic mice that have a receptor, and that was done in 1990s, they will be suffering from polio. That's a great experimental model. You may have heard uh, stories about people who cannot get infected with HIV. That is true. The receptor for HIV in those people is structurally altered. So virus cannot get into the cells. Does that make sense? So receptor for, in case of viruses, completely defines um, organism that can be infected or tissue that can be infected, say West Nile virus that you've all heard about. Sometimes this type of virus is called promiscuous because they infect virtually anything. As far as I know, all animal cell lines that were ever attempted to be infected by West Nile virus, they all got infected. Anything can be infected. West Nile can infect anything from a, a mosquito to a snake to a human. If you, like, you know, expose them. Does that make sense, that hijin story? Now, after that hijin, the microorganism begins its invasion. Now, for viruses, invasion encompasses entering the cell. There are two ways for viruses to enter the cell. If it's enveloped, remember, viral envelope is basically a cell membrane. If it is enveloped, it may fuse with the cell. Okay? If it's in many other cases, virus is taken up into the cell by endocytosis. Are you all comfortable with the term endocytosis? So virus, when it interacts with the cell, cell forms the invagination, the vesicle, okay, takes up the virus, something like a, you know, a Trojan horse of sorts. Okay, take, take, taking virus in. And interestingly enough, remember, um, if you think about um, endocytosis, what gets in the endosome in the cell? What gets into that endocytic vesicle? Either food, or dangerous pathogens. Does that make sense? Now, if that happens, usually, normally, for the cell, the food or dangerous pathogens will be destroyed chemically uh, by, you know, acidic environments or pretty little enzymes. Viruses can survive that aggressive environment, okay? Viruses can survive in the endosome just fine. Often, they actually require acidification to successfully complete the infection. Now, what about bacteria? The mechanisms of invasion, there are as many of them as there are bacterial species. We cannot possibly cover them all. Okay? All I, all I want to say is that some bacteria will actually get into the cell, like Mycobacteria tuberculosis will get inside the macrophage to basically hide from the immune response. Does that make sense? Or they may stay just, you know, in the tissues. So let's say Helicobacter pylori um, that survives in the acidic environment in the stomach actually does not like acid. I mean, it can survive, but it prefers to get away from it by releasing the um, urease, the enzyme that neutralizes hydrochloric acid. The enzyme called mucinase dissolves the mucus. Okay? And when um, mucus is liquefied, Helicobacter can actually get into the epithelium of the stomach and cause inflammation. So that invasion process leads to inflammatory response from the tissue, because that's the tissue damage. Does that make sense? Now, once the microorganism is in the tissue or in the cell, 
the actual disease ensues. And disease is can be caused by either virulence factors that come from a microorganism or the specific response of the host immunity. Let's talk about the role of exoenzymes in the infectious process first. So exoenzymes, what does the uh, prefix exo mean? Outside, yes. These are the enzymes that are released from a microorganism into the outside of it. Let's say the enzyme hyaluronidase is released from Staphylococcus aureus into the tissue and it breaks down the hyaluronic acid, the component of extracellular matrix holding tissue together, meaning that cells of the tissue will start to fall apart, basically. Does that make sense to you? Now, there are four classes of exoenzymes that I want you to know. You don't need to know the specific examples, but you do need to know what these enzymes do. So glycohydrolases break down various types of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are an essential component of the extracellular matrix. Does that make sense? When extracellular matrix is um, destroyed, tissue starts to fall apart. Is that clear? Does that make sense what I'm, what I'm saying here? Now, a second type that I want you to know is nucleases. As you can get from the name, nucleases break down DNA and or, not and, but DNA or RNA. Now, one of the most studied, I suppose, bacterial DNAs is that is at the same time exoenzyme. So the DNA is produced by Staphylococcus aureus in certain immune reactions, cells of Staphylococcus are trapped in place by threads of DNA. Does that make sense? Think of it as like bacteria being trapped in place by multiple fibers. But these fibers are made of DNA. So bacterium releases uh, exoenzyme the DNAs, and DNAs breaks down those strands, essentially freeing up the bacterial cells. Phospholipases uh, break down phospholipids, leading to a uh, lysis, cell lysis. And finally, proteases. They break down proteins. A great example of the protease is collagenase, shown here in this image as, I believe, blue dot. Okay. So this collagenase breaks down protein collagen, one of the key components of the connective tissue, leading to... Um, a disruption of the tissue integrity and clostridium perfringens causes the tissue disease that we know as gas gangrene. Does that make sense to you? So what you need to know are four classes of enzymes and what they do. Now, what they do to effect of this class of exoenzymes destroys carbohydrates, you know, hydrolyzes carbohydrate molecules, glycohydrolases. Makes sense, right? Now, what about um, what about viruses? Viruses usually do not produce a specific virulence factor that uh, you know enzyme that destroys collagen or enzyme that destroys carbohydrates. The overwhelming majority of virus-related pathogenicity sorry, virus-related virulence, comes from the immune response of the host itself, okay? So, disproportional immune response 
may lead to more severe disease and it is often known as so-called cytokine storm. You experience um, kind of a, um, a cytokine bad weather when you have a flu. Okay, how do you how do you feel when you have influenza? Hmm? I mean, you feel like shit. Let's admit it, right? That's how you feel when you have flu. You have fever, you're tired, everything hurts. That's your being, right? So that all these symptoms of being tired, muscle ache, bone ache, fever, um, those symptoms actually come from your immune system trying to clear the virus. Does that make sense? It is pretty well known that symptoms of West Nile virus or um, Ebola virus or yellow fever, dengue fever, those symptoms come from your own infection, okay? From Sorry, from your own immune system, disproportionately hard response to the to the infection it was shown in mice that actually case of say dengue virus if you inhibit certain components of the immunity mice will have much less symptoms which kind of sounds counterintuitive right does that make sense good now another pretty fascinating type of virulence factors are bacterial toxins Now, bacterial toxins are also divided into two major types, endo and exotoxins. Now, endotoxins, they are produced exclusively by gram-negative bacteria. We actually talked about them. Endotoxins are an essential component of the outer membrane, okay? In the gram-negative bacterial cell envelope. Just as a reminder, bacterial cell envelope looks like this. You have a membrane, then you have in gram-negatives, you have a cell wall, and then you have an outer membrane. So in that red layer, the outer membrane layer, here lies endotoxin. Now, interestingly enough, endotoxin, um, all endotoxins of all gram negative bacteria are very similar, practically identical. And they all cause the same type of clinical syndrome. They cause the general inflammation and fever. So, they non-specifically activate your immune system, leading to general inflammatory response. When you have a gram-negative infection, let's say, God forbid, but let's say somebody has a urinary tract infection with some gram-negatives. You following me? Say, urinary tract infection will manifest itself along with, you know, either urethritis or dysuria or pyuria um, or flanking pain, it will manifest itself usually with a high fever and muscle aches. Okay, This high fever, muscle aches and headaches come from immune system response to endotoxin. Now this toxin is heat stable, meaning that you know boiling does not destroy it. However, endotoxin is unlikely to kill a person because median lethal dose is pretty high for it. The downside, sort of, you know, the disadvantage of endotoxin, if there are any advantages to it, that it does not stimulate a specific immune response. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, great example. By the way, great example. Salmonellosis. Infection by Salmonella typhi. Right? So the person gets infected, gets, you know, typical diarrheal vomiting symptoms, okay, signs. And along with that, the person with salmonellosis will run a pretty high fever and will generally feel like crap, okay, with muscle aches and headaches. 
the person recovers, okay, gets exposed to salmonella or say some other gram negative, say shigella, two months later. Basically, same endotoxin will cause the same immune response. There will be no antibodies. There will be no protective immunity against endotoxin. Does that make sense? Every time you get exposed to endotoxin, you're going to get the same responses. We're clear? So it does not stimulate antibody production. Now, what about exotoxins? Well, based on the name, you understand that exotoxins are released from the cell. They aren't part of the cell. So endotoxin, just as a reminder, it's the part of the cell. Exotoxins are released from the cell. can be produced by gram-positive, gram-negative microorganisms. And they are proteins. Now, mechanistically, exotoxins are different from endotoxins since they can cause specific damage to the cell. And we're going to chat about three main classes of exotoxins in a minute. Okay? Are you following me so far? But most of them can be fairly easily inactivated by heat. So they heat labile. There are some that are stable, but most of them are heat labile. However, they're pretty deadly. The median lethal dose is quite low. On the other hand, they do stimulate the generation of antitoxins. Um, you all know about the existence of such thing as tetanus shot. If you get exposed, say, you wound yourself in the forest with a branch, like really badly, okay, or you get bitten by a wild animal, you're not only going to get, especially in the case of wild animal, you're not only going to get the rabies shot, you're also going to get the tetanus shot, which is essentially the antibodies against tetanus toxin that will prevent if your tetanus vaccination you know whenever it was did not work for some reason you know if your tetanus antibody titer in your blood from your vaccination isn't sufficient tetanus shot would kind of boost it up make sense now few terms about toxins the ability to produce toxins, we call it toxigenicity. Microorganism can be more toxigenic or less toxigenic if it produces more toxin, like like more toxin, physically more molecules, it will be more toxigenic. Disease that is called by toxins, bacterial toxins, we call it toxinosis. Say, uh, tetanus is toxinosis, bacterial toxinosis. Toxemia. Presence of toxin in the blood, as we will see, anything emia is in the blood. Make sense so far? Intoxication is the ingestion of the toxin. Um, what we call food poisoning, in many cases, is essentially an intoxication. Um, in the very beginning of the course, we discussed the uh, genus of bacteria, the bacilli. And we mentioned a microorganism called Bacillus cereus, which produces a toxin, a stable toxin, and that toxin causes gastroenteritis. That's a typical bacterial intoxication, what we call food poisoning. Does that make sense to you? So bacterium is gone. Toxin is present. When you get sick, you're not getting sick because of bacteria replicating in your gut. You're getting sick because of the toxin that bacteria produced, that you ingested. We're clear? Now, um, something that is really dear to my heart, I, I, I love the, the, that story about and the toxins. So exotoxins can be fairly easily inactivated, right? You can boil, you can autoclave, you can heat, whatever. Now, endotoxin, as I mentioned, they are heat stable. 
Now, let's play a little game called imagination. Say you have water that you get ready that you want to sterilize. This water will be used later for, um, I don't know, preparation of, of drugs. Okay, make sense? Or you're just doing, you're making some injectable solution, say, just regular IV. Okay. So you prepare that sodium chloride, you stick it in the autoclave, you run the regular sterilization process, you kill all microorganisms. Viruses, bacteria, everything's dead. That make sense? And then you take this IV and you put the IV drip, you know, to the patient. And a few hours later, patient develops absolutely astronomical fever. Now, what's the reason? Think about this. If you had some gram-negative microorganisms in your water, in your fluid, and you sterilized the fluid, you killed all the gram-negatives. Does that make sense? Cells basically fell apart. And, and the toxins... got released into the fluid. Are you following me? What you basically did, you, yeah, it's sterile. There are no microorganisms. You just injected a bunch of endotoxin into the circulation and endotoxins are known pyrogens. It's called pyrogen testing, you know, to check if there are any pyrogens in your preparation. And I was involved quite heavily in um, the pyrogen testing. So conventional, old-fashioned way to test for pyrogens, you take your preparation and you inject it into a rabbit. And then there, there's, a, there's a specified protocol. As far as I remember, it's like, you know, FDA or CDC, whatever. It's approved. You stick it into the rabbit and you measure the rectal temperature. Okay. Now, from one standpoint, it's pretty convenient because it gives you an actual physiological response of an animal. Makes sense, right? Like if you take a vaccine and you stick it into the rabbit, you get the actual physiological response to vaccine. We can say, okay, there may be no bacteria in the vaccine, no endotoxin in the vaccine. Vaccine can still be pyrogenic. It's kind of very, it's very comprehensive test. The problem that comes with using rabbits for the test, first, it's animals. So you gotta have a facility, you gotta have permissions, you gotta have special people that will take care of animals. Second, rabbits are pretty vile animals, okay? And handling a rabbit is a task in itself. And well, third, you know, how do you, there are quantitative parameters, but say if you, Rabbit may have different health conditions. How do you know that rabbit, that particular rabbit at that particular point is fully healthy? Okay, that nothing is going on in that animal. Makes sense, right? So there is some degree of variability. So the question arose, um, is there any way to test specifically for bacterial and the toxins? and nothing else, just for bacterial endotoxins, without using rabbits. The answer came from quite um, um, an unexpected site, from the horseshoe crab called Limulus polyphemus. I believe you all know what horseshoe crabs are. You know, one of the favorite water pets, different zoos, okay? Turns out horseshoe crabs are incredibly ancient animals, they evolved something like 400 million years ago and not really changed since then. And as any arthropods, they do not really have blood. They have a fluid called hemolymph. And that hemolymph has one dominant cell type called amoebocyte. Amoebocyte is a jack of all trades. It's basically a leukocyte platelet and red blood cell all, you know, blended together. It turns out that when 
amoebocytes are exposed to endotoxin, basically to gram-negative, <coughs> sorry, gram-negative bacteria, amoebocyte clots. Okay, it form, well, amoebocytes clot. They form clots that will trap the bacterial pathogens in one place, preventing the spread of the infection <coughs> throughout the horseshoe crab. Does that make sense? So, what scientists did, they basically... I will have to use the, the, the verb bled. They bled a bunch of crabs, although there was no blood involved. They collected a bunch of hemolymph, isolated amoebocytes, lysed them, broke them down, and used that lysate as the reagent to detect endotoxin. The original test uh, was really simple. So... You have a standard of bacterial endotoxin. You make serial dilutions. You expose the serial, you mix the serial dilutions with the LAL reagent. LAL stands for limulus amoebocyte uh, lysate. Okay. So you expose it to the reagent. And reagent causes reagent clots in response to endotoxin. Does that make sense? The, the, at some point, when concentration of endotoxin falls beyond a certain level, there is no clotting anymore. That makes sense? And along with your standard dilutions, you have the dilutions of your sample of interest. Water, saline, whatever. And you see, okay, I diluted my saline, I don't know, 100 times, or I did undiluted saline, there is no reaction, so there are no endotoxin, it's all good, or it's undetectable, stuff like that. Does that make sense? Now, as a person, I, I, I actually did that analysis. Uh, it takes about, so incubation time, um, in order to run the reaction, you have to incubate it at 37 degrees or an hour. So preparation takes about an hour. It takes one hour to do, to incubate, and then reading results like 10 minutes. So it's pretty fast, and you can do it pretty high processivity. The only problem is that your um, you have to order special tubes because they have to be endotoxin free. Everything should be endotoxin free. So those tests were pretty expensive. Okay, but well, first of all, everything that starts off being expensive usually when you know many manufacturers come to the markets. It becomes cheaper, so that what happened to lal test. And on top of that, you know, scientists were looking into what happens, like why clotting happens. You see what I'm saying? So they identified the factor in the lysate called factor C. When factor C is exposed to endotoxin, it gets activated and becomes a protease. Protease is the enzyme that breaks down proteins. Makes sense, right? So they basically said, okay, we identified the enzymatic activity associated with endotoxin exposure. It's the proteolytic activity. What are we going to do next? We're going to make a synthetic compound, which is polypeptide with nucleic acid. Basically, it's the compound that when it is cleaved, okay, when it is cleaved, the substrate, the chromogenic substrate, starts to produce light. You with me? Now, here's the idea. The more endotoxin you have, the more protease you have. Does that make sense? That just, that suggestion. The more protease you have, the more color you're going to have in your sample. Makes sense, right? So in this case, you can actually quantify. You can say, my sample has exactly this amount of endotoxin. My sample has exactly this amount of endotoxin. And this is now a very conventional method to um, detect bacterial endotoxins. We good? 
any questions about lull test. Now, I'm not going to ask you the, like, what's the name of the horseshoe crab or something like this. But I really want you to understand the basic concept behind the modern version of the lull test. We're good? Any questions? Now with this, we are moving on, sorry. We are moving on to three main classes of exotoxins. Now, what I really want you to understand, and we're going to talk about some examples that will help you to better understand the whole idea behind these three classes. So the first class, which I honestly consider boring, is membrane-disrupting toxins, because they like simple. What they do, they disrupt membranes. The majority of them are either forming pores in the membrane, somewhat like, you know, colistin does and other polymyxins. Streptolysin, pneumolysin, alpha toxin, they all form pores in the membrane, disrupting the membrane integrity and eventually leading to the cell being lysed. Is that clear? Another type of membrane disrupting toxins are good old phospholipases. They just break down phospholipids. Just just destroy bacterial, uh, destroy cellular membrane. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now second class that I want to mention are superantigens. We talked about superantigens before when we discussed um, the infection with Streptococcus pyogenes or Staphylococcus aureus. Remember we talked about toxic shock? Remember? There's the there's diffuse sepsis that patients sometimes experience. So, overactivation of immune system. Basically, um, Toxic shock syndrome toxin from, sorry, from Staphylococcus aureus leads to the activation of virtually every cytotoxic T cell in the body, which leads to the massive release of cytokines and chemokines, which leads to a massive inflammation, you know, vasodilation, vascular shock, and uh, hypovolemic shock. So far, are we good? Now, the third, in my opinion, the most exciting type of toxins are intracellular targeting toxins. So this type of exotoxins, remember, those are called exotoxins. This type of exotoxins target specific steps, specific cellular pathways. Am I clear? Let's say cholera toxin. Okay, it specifically activates the enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase produces cyclic KMP. Cyclic KMP opens the potassium channels. Open potassium channels leads to excretion of potassium, and excretion of potassium is followed by osmotic release of water from epithelium, you have diarrhea, loss of electrolytes. That's what cholera is. Okay. Tetanus toxin. It inhibits the release of inhibitory neurotransmitter from upper motor neurons and you have tetanus, spastic paralysis. Botulinum toxin. Inhibits the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junctions. That's flaccid paralysis. Now, at the bottom, you can see diphtheria toxin, which is quite fascinating. So, it's a two-component toxin. It consists of two subunits. One subunit, subunit B, is responsible for the interaction with the receptor on the cell. You can see this interaction on the left. Once the interaction is complete, 
toxin, exotoxin is taken into the cell in the endosome. And in the endosome, it is cleaved into two halves. The B part stays in the endosome and eventually it is degraded. And the A part enters the cellular cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, it turns out that A part will inhibit protein synthesis, which leads to the cell death. Now, what do you need to know about these classes? You have to be able to identify three classes of bacterial toxins, three categories shown in the table on the left. Okay, these ones. Based on the description. Now, why I focus so much on actually talking about real, like real life examples? Because I'm going to give you a real-life example on the test. Some kind of a description of a toxin. And you will have to identify. Is it membrane disrupting? Is that intracellular targeting? Is that a super antigen? We clear? Any questions? We're good? I always say that, you know, this this one slide, it can be done as the semester-long lecture course on immune evasion strategies of pathogens. Like, that's one thing, one thing, one mention here. We kind of do it on past. We can do a lecture course out of it. So, you understand that, you know, it's it's a competition. Whoever wins the competition wins the host. If host immune system wins, the host recovers. If pathogen wins, the host dies. You clear? So pathogens, they learned to evade the immune system. And here's, here's another thing. For a majority of pathogens, killing a host is not an ideal outcome. Does that make sense to you? Especially, well, okay, let's put it this way. In some cases, killing a host is fine. But the death should not come too quickly so the microorganism can be transmitted to another host. Makes sense, right? So you will see that pathogens actually, um, the ones that have been in humans for a long time, they are pretty tame. Okay, let's go back to strategies. So, capsule. That's a bacterial strategy and fungal strategy. Okay? So, bacteria like Streptococcus or Salmonella or fungus like Cryptococcus. They use capsule to prevent phagocytosis, avoid phagocytosis, survive through phagocytosis. Okay. You can see the encapsulated bacteria in the left bottom slide, well, left bottom of the slide. Second one, second strategy that I want to mention, proteases. So um, here you can see the protease, which is shown in a, as a pink colored dots. And proteases are basically exoenzymes that are released from the bacterial cell. They break down antibodies. Does that make sense? For many microorganisms, intracellular infection is the key to survival. Now think about this. When a microorganism is not inside the cell, in the tissue, or in the blood, it can be detected by your immune cells like neutrophils or macrophages, right? When it's inside the cell, such as, let's say, chlamydia, inside of epithelial cell, then you have to rely entirely on the response from the infected cell, from the inside, and it's much less efficient. So intracellular infection allows microorganisms to avoid host immune recognition. Does that make sense? A bunch of microorganisms establish intracellular infections. Rickettsia um, infects 
epithelial cells. Coxiella sparsa, remember, infects epithelial cells as well. Anaplasma, Legionella, and Mycobacterium infect various types of immune cells. Mycobacterium infects macrophages, as well as Legionella does, and uh, different species of anaplasma infect both monocytes and neutrophils. Does that make sense so far? So intracellular infection allows to escape the host immune recognition. Inhibition of innate immune responses. That's honestly my favorite. Viruses do it a lot. So they manage, remember, again, I'm reminding you, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Makes sense to you, right? When they are in the cell, they will produce proteins that will actually inhibit intracellular mechanisms of response to a virus infection. They will stop cell from responding to infection. will make it silent, quote-unquote. Does that make sense? Molecular mimicry. Oh, this is, this is such a beauty. As far as I know, it was very well characterized only once in schistosoma, the pathogenic helminth, so-called blood fluke, okay? So schistosoma does an extremely elegant work in covering itself with the human proteins. Basically like a, a what's the expression, the wolf in a sheep's skin? Is that an exp That's basically what it is. So um, schistosoma monsoni, for instance, can cover itself with the human proteins, okay, human antigens, antigens from us, and, you know, it's going to be my own proteins, so that immune system, when it sees those antigens, says, no, nah, it's fine. That's not a pathogen. Make sense? Um, Complement inhibition. I don't know your AP background. I know some of you took AP too. So you have an idea about immune system. Complement is a pretty efficient innate immune response mechanism. So um, a bunch of viral, fungal, so viral, fungal, sorry, bacterial, fungal, viral pathogens, they all can inhibit complement, different components of it. And, well, as simple as leukocyte killing. Proteins called leukocytins. They belong to staphylococci and streptococci. They just kill white blood cells. Does that make sense? Now, again, matching the description and the term, that's all I want from you. You see what I'm saying? So if I tell you that, you know, well, I'm not going to ask you questions, something like um, Borrelia burgdorferi can inhibit complement. What's the mechanism? Well, complement inhibition, duh, right? So something a bit more sophisticated, nothing tricky, just I'm not going to give you the answer inside the question. Now, one really interesting story that I want to finish with, you know, the first part of the class. The Red Queen Paradox. If you read um, Through the Looking Glass, the Alice thing story, when Alice gets into that land, you know, behind the looking glass, she encounters a Red Queen at some point, and they try to make it to the train station in time. And Alice notices that as she runs faster and faster to make it to a train station, the train station doesn't seem to come any closer. And in frustration, she says to Red Queen something in of sorts, uh, where I'm from, you know, the faster you run, the, the, the quicker you come to your destination point. And Red Queen responds that 
honey in this land, just in order to stay in one place, you have to run as fast as you can. So microorganisms and immune responses, they co-evolve constantly. So immune response, um, you know, something changes in the immune recognition or response that affects the well-being of the microorganism and it selects microorganisms that are more uh, resistant to that immune recognition. Does that make sense? Now, that weeds out the ones that cannot successfully recognize the pathogen. So again, it's the coevolution. And it turns out that if you would look at the, well, tamest of microorganisms, in my opinion, um, helminths and viruses, especially herpes viruses, herpes viruses were in what will future become humans, I mean primates. The, the human herpes viruses were co-evolving before humans. They were co-evolving with primates. Does that make sense? They're like 20 or 40 million years old. So by the time first people uh, kind of, you know, evolution happened about, what, two million years ago, that Lucy lady in Africa. Well, Lucy already had herpes, okay? Does that make sense? So it, it, it really, and if you would look at acute infections, like really bad infections, say rabies or Ebola virus, we never had a coevolution thing. Does that make sense? When it comes into humans, it kills us. Ebola is really bad, but um, we're not getting infected with Ebola very often. It's mostly an animal infection. It's kind of an accidental thing. Does that make sense? So that's what we call a, a red queen paradox, that coevolution actually selects for not the deadliest, but the tamest of microorganisms. Good? Okay. Let's take a break. When we'll come back, we will do the, um, the water thing, and I will run downstairs and grab some, some salad. <laughs>